my goodness. <laughs> well, hello to you too. Hello, it's so nice to see you. And you are in your gorgeous little alcove. Is that in an attic upstairs? Yeah, so we um, we converted the attic. When we had to give up the office for work and stuff, it was like, where can I work? So we've ripped the walls down in the attic and painted it all minty green. And here we are. And where are you? You're, you're not in your usual spot either. I'm not, no, I'm at a, the amazing Teapot Studios at Holtz Yard. So thank you, Charlie Holtz, for making this amazing space. Um, actually, my husband, Paul, and his brother, David, have a office here. So it's really nice that I can come here on a Tuesday night because I don't know about you, but my internet is struggling with all of the Zoom calls that I need to do at the moment. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. So shall we tell everybody why we're here then? Do you want to? For sure. Yeah, we should. <laughs> so we should first put up our disclaimer. So we have an important thing we need to say. I guess first, shall we say who we are, Nick? Yeah, go for it. I mean, I yeah. so what we're both doing now is just like trying to deflect from what we're here. I think we're talking about our office. We're going to talk about the lovely flower in Ashley's hair. And really what you're waiting for is what are these two girls here for talking about? So, Ashley, go on and introduce yourself first. Uh, I love right. that someone else spots the deflection tactics. It's great. So, I'm Ashley King, and I have a podcast called Note to Your Zest. And I feel like I've always been this creative ball of chaos bouncing around. Just everything is colorful and crazy and zany, and I love my life that way. <laughs> um, so that, that's me. I do all kinds of different things. And I just love hanging out with people and having fun. Uh, and what about you? So I'm Nicola, Nicola Jane Little, and I run a company called Mint Business Club. This is the fourth company I think I've started in the last 12 years. And I am also a creator of chaos, energy, bouncy fun. I'm the loud one. I'm the one that you kind of walk in the room and everybody goes, oh, there she is, you can hear her before you can see her. So, and we work together and you're in Mint Business Club and we're doing stuff together now. So it's just like so cool, so cool to be here. Absolutely, I'm such a big fan of Mint Business Club actually. So shout out to any Minties listening because they are super awesome. And yeah, I think it's a great space for anyone to have a bit of support or somewhere to hang out with each other. So Nicola and I decided to do a podcast together uh, and a live stream when we realized that the two of us have something in common and it's a lot to do with chaos. <laughs> the chaos that we, I think, both have been creating for so long that we just understood as us, our own chaos that we create, it's what we live in. And then about, what was it, about five weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, you got in touch with me and Suzanne, actually, at the club. And you were asking if anybody that we knew of had ADHD. And it was the weirdest moment because I was at that time in the process of going for a diagnosis for ADHD. And so you, so I realized you were like about four or five weeks ahead of me diagnosis for ADHD the chaos diagnosis shall we call it I think it's it a great so it was so weird and I think it's a great thing to call it together because actually I mean what a crazy thing to find out that you've got this thing and it's a label and it's different and you've always thought you were normal maybe a bit quirky or unusual or you know like I just I just couldn't believe it at first when I first found out. So to have someone else to share that experience with and kind of go through that journey has been amazing for me. And that's why I'm so glad we can have these chats. You know, we'll be doing this live stream probably fortnightly and uh, turning it into a podcast as well so that we can share this story and hopefully reach out to some others who may be going yeah. through similar challenges. Yeah, for sure. And I think we're really keen to, for everybody listening, watching, to read the disclaimer. So neither of us are experts in ADHD at all. We're not practitioners, we're not clinical, but we're experts only just in our own experiences and what we've both been through and why we ended up, you know, I'm 45 years old and I've got this diagnosis, so it's really weird because I've lived a life of chaos, you know, and Ashley in her 30s, she has lived a life of chaos and just got her diagnosis. So we thought 
that we'd start sharing our experience because you know for me if i can get to 45 and not realize and then realize and boy does it tip your head around all over the place then there's probably other people listening who are going to be able to re relate to some of the stuff we share ashley and i think it's i think it's just really important to talk about stuff and and maybe and maybe there'll be one person listening going do you know what i'm a way to find out about that uh, that that resonates well, um, um that's one of the biggest things because we both saw something online that helped us define this. I watched a video and you read a blog. So yeah. how many people might be struggling with stuff in their everyday life who don't even know that there could be something which, you know, can be explained by a neurological difference or something in their mind, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. I guess if you look back, Nicola, what was like school like for you? So I'm going to be really honest, I can't remember until I was about nine or 10. And the thing is, is I was a really good kid. And I know I was because one of the big things with me is that I just want people please. So I would never have behaved in a way that would have upset anybody around me, my teachers, my parents. You know, I, I was a good girl. And I don't remember until I was nine or 10, where I have some very specific, not very lovely memories. I don't remember school at all. But as I grew, went through um, secondary school, I, I, re, I, I know that I struggled, but I managed to always latch on to wonderful friends. And one in particular, Paula, if you ever listen to this, I love you and adore you, but um, who helped me get through, right? Because the thing with ADHD is you, you, like, you struggle so very much with so many different things, right? This, this, this finishing of stuff, starting of stuff, paying attention to stuff, daydreaming instead. I mean, it, so like in a school environment where you're expected to start picking up that pace, that's when I think for me it started to get more difficult. Um, but what about you? I mean, can you remember your primary school? Can you remember having like issues at school? Absolutely, yeah. I remember a teacher telling me she would chop my hands off if I didn't stop fidgeting and I was a really young age and that was like a way to calm myself and I remember feeling so anxious then sitting on my hands all the time so I wouldn't move around um I also know that I would get in trouble for talking in class and I had such a nice headmistress who created something called the chatterbox club at lunch times and that was a way that I could just go and learn to debate and learn to do oral presentations and tell stories and just channel that chatter into something. So big yeah. shout out to her, she was amazing. And I think I just didn't realize that girls are different of boys from what I've read. You know, as we've said here, we're not practitioners or anything like that. But what I noticed is I always thought ADHD was like naughty kids. Actually, my brother has ADHD, you know, he was diagnosed at five. So I thought it was just little boys who were naughty in class. But actually, and I, I was a people pleaser too, you know, I wanted to be little Miss Perfect all the time. That was my goal. You know, if I'm perfect, people will like me. If I'm perfect, mom and dad will love me. Like that was my running kind of, um, track and actually this is kind of embarrassing I know we're getting really personal here but I had this thing I used to do where I would I would try to be perfect every day and when I wasn't I would then try and restart the day so when you have ADHD as well there's so many things like you just can't be perfect because you just don't think in a normal way in my experience so I mean I would find if I was clumsy or if I did something wrong I kind of pretend that I'd started the day again and I would erase that. And I would, even if I didn't work, if I felt I didn't wake up in a perfect way, like a, a good girl or whatever, I would have to pretend to go to sleep. And it's just crazy. So yeah, looking back, I'm, I'm laughing a lot at myself. But it's just strategies, okay? It's strategies of coping. So when I was at school in uh, Comprehensive, I learned to play the French horn. I, I did, I went in on the grade three and I did my grade three was working to grade four but i could not have bared for a single second to ever do a solo or to be ever be vulnerable and exposed so i was okay i was okay when it was everybody playing and i could just like hide underneath everybody else 
But of course, that's not how those things go. There is there wasn't an amount of money, a thing you could have given me to convince me to be vulnerable, at, you know, 12, 13, 14, and to put myself on the spot and play. And and so I couldn't regress. Like, I, I just couldn't take it any further. And, and so that, I think, was probably a little bit misconstrued as I'd lost interest and, and it, you know, and I wasn't good at it. And I told, myself, I told myself I wasn't good enough to do it. I mean, you know, all of this stuff. But actually, the reality is, is like I remember sitting there sweating and, and itching out my skin so nobody would look at me. So I wouldn't stand out. So I would never do that solo. And I can remember there's a video from us at school and I can see me doing a bit and I was dying inside. I mean, this wasn't just... I didn't want to make a mistake and be laughed at. This was my world would end if anybody noticed me. Therefore, I'm not even going to try to do anything to be noticed. So when we talk about ADHD, I think actually people are going to relate to loads of the traits of it. But I think we need to be really clear about the fact that what we go through isn't just sometimes that you would forget your keys or that moment when you've gone upstairs and you've forgotten what you've gone up for or well, like a, a gazillion other things because we all do that absolutely we all do that but for you and I um it is debilitating it, it is actually de utterly debilitating and what I think we learn is how many strategies we've already got in place before we even know no one knew that we had this thing right this label we, we've just, like you're saying, you put so many strategies into place. You had to restart your day in the middle of your day if it hadn't gone well, right? So what a strategy that is that you'd put into place to cope with what was going on. You know, a lot of mine was I just stopped doing stuff. I'm not I'm not doing that anymore. That anymore. I can't be that vulnerable. It's, yeah. It's, it's a fascinating thing, so... I think it is it's fascinating. One of the things I'm interested in is the constant chatter. So what I found is now that I'm on medication, oh my gosh, it's so much better. I feel calm for the first time in my life. And what I didn't realize is that other people don't have it in the same way. So like, I felt like my brain before was just like this whirlwind of activity and noise and ideas and you know uh it was really hard to stay concentrating in classes or presentations at any of those things and any of those spaces do you have the chatter too oh it's just like i just can't i can't even begin to explain how many conversations happen in my head at once and that i thought i mean I, i've stood in front of people and, and said i'd never invite you in my head i wouldn't want you to ever have a nickel moment like I, I just couldn't do it because it is it is like there are hundreds of people sometimes all talking at the same time and there is not a sentence that gets finished so like when when you you start thinking about one thing and it's not that you could you could deviate to this or that and then bring yourself back i mean I'll, I'll be thinking about one thing and i'm on another planet in another universe in a different room that i don't realize i got to or, or like I have just literally got no idea where this stuff comes from. So if you can imagine, I suppose, anybody listening that's been to one of our events, if there was a hundred people in a room all speaking at the same time with loads of different tonation and all the stuff, right? And it's just non-stop, non-stop. Like Claire Robinson, it is, it is entirely the most exhausting thing I've ever but I just thought everybody, you have done it there, I can't finish in a sentence. I thought everybody's head inside like that, right? I, I just thought that everybody's chatter was was just as if you've got a really big group of people all talking to yourself at the same time on a speed and train flying around the world. I just thought that's what it was like for everybody. Apparently for sure. not. <laughs> exactly. Apparently not. Apparently and th this is also why I love live streaming and the live comments that come through because shout out to Claire she's an amazing woman I first saw her at an event it was actually Michelle Minikin's Inspiration North event then called LinkedIn Local and Claire just got up and she just started singing she just started singing the song and I was like what on earth are you doing this is crazy and then she did a talk on courage and it was really powerful and inspiring and i just couldn't believe her guts i thought she was amazing 
Yeah, and, and, and this is one of the things with those of us with us as I'm learning is that there is a, just a, I, I don't know, we, the energy we have, obviously, I mean, my ADHD is, is both hyperactive and impulsive. So those of you that know me will know the hyperactivity, you know, because the hands are going, the head looking about. You will possibly have been on the other end of, of some of my uh, impulsiveness because the stuff that comes out of my mouth, sometimes I don't even know that I've thought it it's like literally something come out of my mouth and I haven't actually thought the, the thought to, to have that thing coming out of your mouth so, so but there's some type of ADHD and I think what I'm really keen to do is always talk about the positive side of it because we can talk about and I think we should share some of the difficulties so people really do understand that we're not just forgetful or rude or whatever the labels or naughty like naughty kids but I mean there's so much creativity in people with ADHD and of course others, others, but if we, if, you know, for, for my experience, you know, I can have 62 ideas in about a minute and a half and some of them are really brilliant, like, wow, brilliant. I mean, I can't stop most of them and I certainly couldn't finish any of them, right? But honestly, some of the ideas I have are so weird. And so you, you put us in a room with loads of people and it's like, boom, 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 boom. Right, but we finish it for us. But actually, I think then, so, you know, as a kid, did you feel different? When did you realize for you it wasn't quite the same? So if we just talk through maybe getting to that point of diagnosis, when when did you know? When when did you know that you just weren't everybody else? So it's a really funny because I'm so forgetful, ADHD. I didn't even turn my mic on today. So I've just turned my mic on. So before you will have heard me through the webcam, but it wasn't very good. So this That's is an right. example. <laughs> this is an example with ADHD where you just forget stuff. Um, Claire's come in as well and said the term's really outdated, but also we can focus incredibly well on things that interest yeah. and motivate us. Yeah. That is so yeah. true. When you've got something to hyper focus or latch onto, it is really powerful. So um, for me, I guess I always knew something, I knew certain traits, for instance, um, so I'm, I've am i always been best at the last minute, and I mean like the last minute the last assignments, minute. you know, even before we came on tonight, so we had a quick sound check at like two minutes, no, eight minutes to go, you know, it's just, it, it, there's so almost this time. feeling, there's this feeling of like, you create the chaos and then it feels great. I, I get such an adrenaline rush and I feel that that is, for me, I enjoy it, but for the people around me, it is so chaotic and crazy. And this took a long time for me to learn. So there's certain things I've always known were a bit of a struggle. Um, but I do think for me, the, the way I found my diagnosis was actually my uh, MBA towards the end just became so difficult and the main thing was it's a very academic course a lot of academic writing and i was struggling with structuring and getting thoughts out of my head into some sort of uh coherent flow was extremely difficult and it actually meant that i i just felt so stupid and what i was surprised at i don't know about you nicola and again this is quite personal when I was diagnosed, the psychiatrist said, you are um, working be beneath your intellectual ability. You are not uh, rising even to a quarter of your potential. You, you know, you're just not, you're not um, achieving a lot of the things you could be because you're struggling with all of this stuff. And that was quite a shock to me. Yeah. Um, because you probably know it inherently. You probably have those ideas in there. You want them down and you're like, why can't I just get this on paper? Why can't I just write this down? There's a lot of times that you're just like, why can't I just, that, that sentence to myself, why can't I just do the dishes? Am I really that lazy? Why, why does this stuff itch me so much? And the, everything I touch makes me itch and my skin hurts. Like what is, why am I so super sensitive to everything? Why can't I just finish that thing? Why can't I? So this this constant dialogue for me through my probably my let, let's say through 
comprehensive school, but certainly into A levels, into doing my degree. Which, by the way, you know, I have two A levels. I failed one. I chose my A levels based on what my friend was doing because she she got me through everything. I mean. I, I, Paula used to bring uh, pens and pencils to school for me because I go to school every day and I still can't remember to take pens and pencils or or the bits that you anyway. So like so, but why can't I just and I and I, I remember through my twenties at work, and I've got some hideous stories and I'm not ready to share them tonight. But I I used to look around at everybody else and think, why can't I just use a CRM system? Why can't I just put that data in? Why can't I? Why, why can't I just do what they do? Why do you always have to be the loudest, the one on shore? Because I wasn't like that at school at all. There was a point at which, some, at some point, my, my personality changed to be the loud, loud, loudest in the room, all, almost as a way of deflecting from the fact that it was just almost crippling to be in the room, right? So so I, if I be the loudest and everybody's already looking at us, but if I if I control that, then it's not the same as you standing there doing something wrong and feeling so and so stupid, right? So there is a point where that changed because, you know, you could put me in front of 200 people on a stage now and I'd love it, but I certainly wasn't like that as a kid at all. But I have never felt the same. Like, I, I know I never had a voice for it till I started working for myself, but I know that I didn't fit in, right? I just didn't fit in. And, and I tried so damn hard to fit in and i tried to be really good and i and i know what i'm really good at and i and i tried to the point of utter exhaustion every single night but i didn't it didn't work so so then you know you, you're going through your career and you're changing jobs and i'll just change to that job and i'll be here for you for a year and i'll change to that job and, and all of a sudden you know you get to the point where you're like it's you that's changing everything. It's mine. This is you. You are the common denominator, Nick. You, you are the person in the middle of all of this. And and so for me, I've always looked at people who who could do other stuff like admin, like, oh my gosh, right? Admin. Like make a cake. You're joking, aren't you? Like actually decide what to eat. Actually have a relationship with food that isn't about always being too fat chucking it in the bin, don't want to eat properly, couldn't be bothered to cook, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I just have never felt the same as what my perception of what everybody else feels. And isn't that weird? Because I think there'll be loads of people who can relate to that. But I've just always known there's something just a little bit weird. And celebrate it, mind, because I am absolutely for celebrating everything different, totally, which is why we've decided to do this. But but I've never felt like a fit in. Not, not like I do now, not, never, ever, like in all of my, <laughs> ever. I think that's so interesting because I so identify with that, especially the idea of not fitting in and I tried so hard and, you know, the masking, the trying to be like everyone else, the trying to be perfect, the, you know, I often got feedback. Um, So, you know, as a manager or at various times in my life where you got, 360 feedback exercises. I'd often get feedback, things like, um, you're a really complex individual. And I'd be like, well, what does that mean? And I think what was happening is I was presenting, trying to be the strong front, but underneath people weren't really seeing or understanding what was inside, or sometimes my behavior was misinterpreted. And that was quite hard to get my head around. Now I understand it a lot better. And I think a part of that is if you're trying to be something you're not, so you're trying to be super organized, but you struggle with organization, you then become controlling with it, or that was my experience as a manager. So yeah. it was a real learning curve. I mean, you were talking there about baking a cake. My gosh, the people who can bake, like you guys are amazing, but also yeah. I set reminders to eat. Even now, I'm 32 years old. I forget to eat. Yeah, I do. I just don't know that it's something I should do. Like. I remember to drink a, water, a glass of water at the end of the day and I'll be so thirsty I might have four full pints of water because I'm so thirsty and another thing that I've noticed is I, I was thinking about this the other day I'd like to ask you Nicola how do you yeah. make a cup of tea right I'll tell you quickly how I make a coffee right I love coffee first thing in the morning I want to make a coffee five hours later I'll have the coffee 
Let me just explain. I go to put the kettle on. On the way, I see some clothes. I'll pick them up, go and put them in the washing machine. Find a set of clothes that are wet from the night before and they won't hang up because I forgot about them. So I've got to wash them again. I leave the dirty clothes there. Um, I go upstairs because I think, oh, uh, I need to go water the plants. So I'll start watering the plants, go upstairs, and then I'll find a magazine and I'll read it for 20 minutes. And then I'll remember, oh, I was making a cup of tea. So I'll go back down, boil the kettle again, repeat and repeat. Then I'll find there's no milk. So then I'll go out to the shop, find I've locked myself out of the house and I don't have my card, so I can't buy anything. And I don't have any um, coins. So there's no point having gone. And also I forgot my mask. And it repeats like this over and over every day. And I, I actually have a checklist and a star chart to kind of track habits. Just yeah, it's and the thing is, right, I'm laughing, right, but it's so, and I will use as well, debilitating, because for anybody that's listening, imagine that that is constant every single day. And in between that, you're going, why can't I just remember to shut the door? Why can't I just remember where my key? Where is my wallet? Like, where is my wallet? Well, but you put it there, but it has to be somewhere. And so every single action that you, you take, that's an executive function, a thing that you've got to do to get a result, right? Every single thing that we do, you have to try six or seven or 27 times to get it right. There is no just do that thing to get it right. I mean, like everything is, is like that continuously better with medication for both of us, you know, and, and that is our personal experience, but we are both finding that the medications help them. But every single mortal damn thing that you do is, you, you've got it, you've, I mean, honestly, if you don't all see us two minutes before we started this podcast, like, shall, shall we plug the headphones in? Oh my God, I kind of do it now, man, we've only got six, 60 second countdown. That was about as planned as we got. I mean, it's just, it, and it works sometimes and sometimes it really doesn't work. But I mean, the amount of times I've forgotten about the washing and I'm super sensitive to smell, so it has to get rewashed. So then you rewash it again. Um, and then, you know, it's just like, it's just a constant, it's so exhausted, constantly trying to remember to do the stuff. I mean, honestly, so once, right, and some of it is dangerous. So I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. The, 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 once I lost my switch card, my banker's card on the bath, Right, so why was my bank card in the bath anyway? What the hell was I doing with it in the bath? Because it was a time before mobile phones and ordering online. So my switch card's on the back of the bath. I mean, I, like I searched my house. I was with my parents, searched every mortal bit of this house for this bank card. And then I, and then I cancel the card and then it goes on the bath. And you're like, well, why the hell did it? My mom's like, why is she, why? So the, and this goes on all the time. You know, I've had more bank cards than you can imagine. But... One time, I mean, I, I lit a candle in the bath. There's obviously a bath theme here. I lit a candle in the bath, Ashley, and I put it behind me, right? So, you know, you, you get in the bath, you're going to have this smelly candle on, how lovely. Put the candle behind me and then and then immediately forgot I'd done it and my hair was on fire on the back of my neck. So I, I put this and I'm lying there thinking, God, that's a funny smell. What's that burning smell? And like my hair had just started to burn because I'd put my head back onto the candle that I'd just lit and forgot about in the same four seconds. So of course then my head's in the water and I come up and I'm sitting there going, why would you do that? How, how, how can you possibly have forgotten that you've lit a candle, put it behind your head and now you've got your back of your hair's on fire and yet you've just had to douse your head? I mean, it's just, so this this idea that it's something that's just a little bit forgetful or a little bit, you know, impulsive or you've done a daft thing, it's just constant and be dangerous. I mean, ask me how many times I've ironed my leg. Because, <laughs> of course, you do your ironing on the floor because you can't be bothered to put the ironing board up because you're lazy or you're not, right? And so what do you do? You iron on the floor, so then you burn the carpet you're burning the carpet, the carpet's sticking to the iron, which by the way is going all the way all over your clothes, which you're ironing on the floor, which you shouldn't be doing in the first place. And then you've just done your leg. <laughs> it's oh my just, goodness. it's this, I mean, it's, right, right? There's so much of that stuff. But you are left feeling demoralized, like stupid, um, questioning your sanity, 
think honestly think in that you just there is literally something wrong with you because who irons the leg after you've melted the carpet to the iron i mean why would you even keep trying i mean it's just absurd and then of course every single time you try and iron something again there's a bit of carpet goes on with every time i mean this is you know i don't iron a lot because like why would you <laughs> but honest so i think so, so this idea that like you know what you're saying where you go from one thing to another if i turn around and look over now i would notice the pile that none of you could see and i'd want to go and fix it and probably forget i'm talking to you oh yeah <laughs> honestly hi lovely ian we're your fan girls we absolutely love ian farrow he's awesome thanks for watching um, I wanted to share a funny story with you, Nick. So you mentioned about the fire. Oh my goodness, right? So I, in my old house in, in Benjamin and Gateshead, we had a flat downstairs and I decided I was going to feed the cat. It was a stray cat. I felt really sorry for it. So I'd put tuna out the back for it. Okay. I ran a bath one day, very excited about my bath. Like Nicola, I lit a candle. Instantly forgot about the candle. Forgot that the candle had paper on it. It was one of those decorative candles that had paper on the side and some sort of hessian string, a uh, plastic bathroom. Went to go do the dishes, do chores. Again, was doing washing, completely forgot. And this cat I'd been feeding ran in and then all of a sudden I just saw it run out the house really fast. And I was thinking, well, that's strange. What's going on? And then I didn't have my glasses on. So I didn't realize that there was smoke in the house until my husband at the time boyfriend paul ran through and he was like what is going on i had no idea i had no glasses on didn't have any idea just happily doing the dishes looking forward to my bath went through and the house is literally on fire i mean this this was a basement flat there were people above two floors above and either side um you know with families and things like this the ceiling was on fire the the, the candle was really high it was an oil candle, so we threw water on it, and then that just made it go really high. Um, it was so scary, and the entire bath was melted from the plastic. And it's stuff like this. Ian's right. Paul needs a medal. He's an amazing, amazingly, uh, you know, I don't know what I would do without him. I'm nearly tearing up here um, because he's just so patient with me. And it's stuff like this, the, the problems or the things we do, can have very dangerous outcomes and very expensive outcomes you know and sure. physically harm you like you mentioned you know ironing your your leg i have noticed uh i didn't notice this before the meds but actually i always had bruises and cuts and grazes and burns mm -hmm. and i didn't feel things i didn't feel hot water i had no sense of sensation like i just could not like I didn't feel it at all. And then I'd find bruises and bangs and like all kinds of marks on myself and think, well, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Like we swapped beds because I used to walk into the bottom of the other bed because it didn't have like, it was just, you know, a, a flat bed. And, but it had pointy corners and it really hurt. And I walked into it every day, like every day. And this is the thing, someone else who was neurotypical would learn the spatial awareness and where the corner of the bed is. So like every day like you, I'm covered in bruises, right? I don't know where they've come from. And I'm, I'd look down and go, hey, look at that. Where's that bruise come from? What do you think I did there, right? And, I, and it got to the point that we just had to sort the bed because when I did realize how often I was walking into the bottom of this bed, by the way, there was loads of room to get around it. it, it, it and, and so you are forever compensating, right? So we're forever compensating for the daft stuff that we do which can have really dangerous implications. Obviously, you, you can't be putting a candle on for both of us and causing fires and, and leaving. I mean, the, the iron's been on, the straighteners have been on, I've had to come home, you know, more times than you can guess. It's, it's because you just don't remember. Your brain has run out of the chemical in it to help you perform that executive function. And, it, and, and it's really distressing because you want to be able to perform the executive function that everybody else can, but you know, but you just don't. You, you've just run out with of the juice, the magic juice to to get you to do those things, and you know it 
it, it affects friendships for sure. I've been in situations and I've lost really good friends, not had a clue why, not had a clue. I knew it must be me. I've done something wrong, but I'm super sensitive to that. Jobs, talked about jobs. I mean, I, I've, many times I've talked to our members about me being unemployable. You know, right, who would want to employ me, this big daft loud? It's just, I mean, it's just torturous. So, so uh, seriously bad relationships in my case, you know, things I've done, things I'm so ashamed of, I will never talk about publicly be, because my brain didn't, finish or didn't or, or, or I expressed in a way that I should never have done and and in my life I have never meant to hurt anybody but I have a particular knack of stuff very black and white stuff coming out my mouth before I've even realized it's out and it's just not the done way to express yourself now I'm a bit better now I'm like in my 40s so I guess you know some of that is the impulsivity of youth also but with a brain that just makes you gob go, boom, you know, it has it has caused an awful lot of pain for me that I didn't even realize was the cause of it. I just thought sometimes I wasn't a nice person or or I was thick or, you know, there has been a lot of self uh, depreciation. Is that the right term? You know, I've always envisioned myself as being about six times larger than I am and unable ever to look at a photo of myself till I, till it's about three months old and then I can look at them and it's really good and I'm the queen of selfies as well now but I've but a proper photo can't bear them and I know loads of women would say that but but I I for ages I thought I had and have touched on having a, an eating disorder because I just thought and what I be is absolutely not what I am and what other people say and so you just you run in this life that is just like full of questions and the negativity sometimes in it not other people's mind and this idea that we will never live up to our potential and that is why i think i pursued my diagnosis because i do not want to get to 80 and think you just never lived up to your potential ever and it scares me it scares me absolutely with it hence doing this with you and the stuff that i'm doing um strange one i think you're amazing i think you're so brave i mean chatting about this stuff we're talking about like real struggles we'll de we deal with in front of everyone you know um the thing is though when you share these things and you share stuff you're going through i really believe that it helps people i couldn't believe when i recently yeah. kind of came out the closet of adhd how many lovely messages I got, but also how many people said, oh my gosh, I would never have known, or I really have been struggling with something else. And so since then have been able to go for uh, assessments and get support and they've been able, It's in, you know, I really think that when you know what the answer is, sometimes it can save your life. It did for me, um, medication's great. I mean, there's one thing that I'd really like to talk about and just to ask, so both Nicola and I have experienced this, but when we were freshly diagnosed, um, we experienced this thing that I like to call the shame spiral. And this was horrific. So like Nicola says, you know, thinking about all those things that you might've done wrong or said or done. I mean, we can't change the past. We can only change who we are now, but actually trying to deal with all of this stuff. And, and I think that's the thing is the forgiveness of like, wow this is crazy like if you if you had seen the world in a different way if you'd had that diagnosis earlier could you have done things better could you have had more support could you have had more uh, strategies i felt like if i'd been diagnosed at the start of my mba i would have coped a lot better mm -hmm. um so i think this idea of of living in the the kind of first tur turmoil of what on earth is going on? I think that is quite hard, that first stage of diagnosis. I think that I'm living and breathing that as we talk because, I mean, I will never forget when you uh, dropped me a message and said, you know, I'm, I'm four weeks ahead of you. You're going to go in this shame spiral straight away. And I was already in it and you had, a, you had a phrase for it. And it was, you know, what you're trying to do is work out all of these moments that have affected you so badly forever 
And for me, some of them are when I was very, very young and I, I feel them acutely as if it was yesterday. You know, I'm talking 30, 35 years ago. The, the, it's time to let this stuff go. But you, you try and then replace your life and your understanding of your life with this new label, right? What this means. And you, you're sort of going, God, if I ju had I just done that and if I had just known there and would I have done that or made that decision or this, that, and the other. And for a few days, that trying to adjust to that, I think, is particularly difficult, right? So anybody listening who's freshly diagnosed with anything at all, literally reach out. Literally reach out because, you know, I, I've had mine, what, three weeks now? Is it about, of course, I wouldn't remember. It's about three weeks or four weeks or something like that. But I, I'm still finding it really hard to adjust my inside my head, my 40-odd years, you know, 45 years of being me and being just me, because that's what everybody keeps saying. But Nick, it's just you, man. It's just you. You just like that. But I might not have been like that had I known. I might not have been like that. There's, was, there's, was, you know, I'm really super proud of everything I've achieved. You've achieved what we do every day. The help, the support, what we do. But uh, it doesn't quite match with how I see myself either. So I have to struggle on with that. Would it have been different? Yeah, but 20 years ago, nobody associated ADHD with women at all. It was a boys, naughty boys thing, and that is it. That is it. Right, it's only in the last two decades that any kind of research proper has been done in females with this thing. There are so many undiagnosed women out there, it is extraordinary, like literally extraordinary, which is another reason we're doing this, I think. Um, and, and not just for women, for everybody. But this shame spiral, I have so many moments that I feel deeply and acutely ashamed of my behavior or something I've said or something that I know that other people would not have reacted or done that thing in that way. Now, Everybody else listening has their own story. Everybody's done stuff that they're bothered. Everybody's done stuff they're ashamed of. But I, I, I lay back that most people can move on from a lot of that stuff. Whereas for me and maybe for you, Ashley, tell us, but it just doesn't go away. It lives very much in the present, even if it's 20 years ago. If I could have just, why did I do right? And that, and that's a real struggle because you're trying to be better now. But you're struggling on with the shame spiral of the stuff that you've done that you wish you hadn't done, which, by the way, you can't change. And if you, if you did change, you wouldn't be who you are now. I mean, how do you even reconcile that stuff? And that's where I am now. And it's, it's really, it is difficult. It's really difficult. It's so powerful hearing you, what you're saying. And it is really vulnerable for you to share it. I mean, it's a raw experience, definitely going through that spiral, reliving -li certain yeah. things. It's almost like re-experiencing trauma in a way, um, you know, because you're having to deal with these things. I think, um, yeah, one of the one of the best things we can remember is that we are exactly where we need to be right now. We're in a healing space, and we we've got meds, and we can, you know, get better and deal with this. And and that's where I just have hope that through this and through this new experience of learning myself without the mask, I can actually be myself and actually share the real me with my friends and family rather than the person that I've been hiding. So I'd like to say, because we're, we're, um, we're about to run out of time, I guess, um, it would be really nice, Nick, to, to finish on a positive note. So how can we, like, what's your number one thing you love about your ADHD? What do I love about my ADHD more? Um, um, I think it is my curiosity in others, right? I like literally love everybody. Now it's a downside because I literally fall in love with everybody all the time, like ridiculous. But like I love finding out about people. I love to hear their stories. I love knowing that I can help. Um, and I think that is supercharged because of the ADHD, right? So, of course, the business that I've got is about helping people listening to the stories and helping them get better in their business. So that bit of me, like everybody is fascinating. You know, everybody has a story. And I love, I love that. I love that. The fact that I, every day I wake up going, who am I going to meet today? What are we going to talk about today? Who can I help today? And it's like a little kid, right? Because it is like Groundhog Day. It's like, oh, oh it's a new day. Well, what can we do today? That I love. I love that uniqueness in me that just loves other people and their stories. But what about you? What is what is your bestest, bestest thing, do you think? 
because of your ADHD. Well, I will share it with, it with you, but thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing. But everyone loves you right back, Nicola, and they do. <laughs> so thank you for uh, sharing that, Sarah. For me, uh, I would actually say there's three things. Well, let's not be greedy, but I I just have a lot of zest, right? That's why I called my podcast Note to Your Zest. But I just am so excited for every day. You know, I love my life. I love um, experiencing things and learning and I love the dark, the, the light and the shadows. I love the kaleidoscope of colors that make us who we are. And I'm interested in that journey. So mm -hmm. I feel like um, for me, I just love that it has made me more empathetic to people, perhaps because I felt I didn't fit in. But I've always been able to kind of go into a room and read it and been able to sort of seek out someone who's maybe a bit lost or needs a bit of comfort. So yeah, and also just appreciating the beautiful around. So getting lost on the way to work because I'm losing the time because I'm looking at the pretty ducks or, you know, admiring the trees or whatever it might be. Now I understand that, you know, there's certain things in my brain that make me dawdle. <laughs> but in the past, you know, just getting excited by the ants and the insects and whatever, I'm getting too happy about it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I think um, we've had a lovely comment as well from Joanne. Thank you so much, Joanne. She said she's really proud of us both and, and thank you for the bravery. It's really nice to hear these comments because it is scary to put yourself out there like this. And, you know, it's just so nice that we can share our real selves with you without the masks and, you know, just be who we are. So thank you so much for listening, guys. Is there anything you want to finish with that, uh, Nick? I'm going for a lie down now. I, I'm absolutely wired, exhausted, stroke happy with so I just hope that if there is anybody listening, right, if you want to reach out to Ashley or I, please do. As we say, we are only experts in our own life. We don't we don't know. We, you know, we are really, really new to this stuff. But honestly, if you want to ask us anything about, you know, how how we got our diagnosis, loads of people have asked me and I've bigged up my, my my story is a little bit different from yours i went through the adhd foundation which is a foundation in liverpool um it's charity so that's where i got mine and i know you went private as well to get your diagnosis but i just want anybody who ever feels like the need to reach out and if you think you're a little bit different celebrate it with bells and whistles and shininess and colors and vibrancy because we're so different all of us and the labels don't matter. We're all different, but it's so great to be different. It is. Imagine. I mean, imagine if everybody was like me. Oh, my gosh. Right? We need some quiet. <laughs> right? But isn't it? It's so great to be different. Absolutely. And it, I so agree. Well, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Hopefully this has inspired you and you will see how we are turning our chaos courageously into, into beautiful creativity. You know, we, we are really excited about this live stream. We'll probably be sharing every fortnight. We'll see how we go. We've got ADHD, plans might change. <laughs> but thank you so much for listening. And yeah, we'll see you soon. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.